Well, there was a couple that were Christmas shopping uh, at the mall, and the shopping center was packed, and as the wife walked through one of the uh, corridors, she was surprised, and she looked around to find that her husband was nowhere to be seen. Uh, she was quite upset because they had a lot to do, so she became worried, and, and she called him. I don't know if this has happened to any of you ladies. Usually you can just look at the bench in the mall where all the guys are sitting at the center. You don't have to look very far. They're usually all just gathered there, sitting. Uh, you guys know what I'm talking about, by the way? Can I get a name? Yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> well, she became worried, and she called on her mobile phone to ask him where he was. And in a quiet voice, he said, do you remember the jewelers we went to in about five, about five years ago, where you fell in love with that diamond necklace that we couldn't afford, and I told you that I would get it for you one day? Oh, the wife, she started to get very excited, and then she started to get choked up and started to cry, and she said, yes, I do remember that shop. He said, well, I'm in the pub next door. <laughs> You know, the phrase, getting ready for Christmas, can strike joy or terror into human hearts, depending on who you're talking to. And so for many of us, the statement, getting ready for Christmas, it can mean all sorts of things. For most of us, I, I think it means decorating the house, right? Getting out the seasonal recipes, braving the shopping mall, watching holiday movies that give us all those Christmas feels. You know who you are and preparing for special gatherings with family and friends. But Advent is more than getting ready for Christmas, isn't it? Advent is about getting ready for Christ. Advent helps us to focus on the spiritual meaning of the season, which is often easily missed. And it's not easily missed just because of all the things that need to get done or be purchased but also because of the pace at which all these things occur. Do you remember when you were growing up, when your parents said, may it, at the dinner table after you were outside running around, right? And you would come in and you'd start woofing down your dinner and they would say what? Slow down and chew your food. Right? Maybe you said that to your kids. Slow down and chew your food. They knew we couldn't taste or digest, much less, our food when we tried to woof it down. Hmm? Well, Advent is like a good parent, telling us to slow down so that we can actually taste and see just how good the Lord is. We can taste and really sink down into and experience the goodness of God as we slow down and receive the gifts that waiting in Advent can offer us. Now, unlike the preparation that happens before Christmas, which is usually focused on practical things and pleasurable things, both of which are fine, today's text invites us into a deeper way of preparing for the arrival of Messiah. And it does that by putting before us this, doing works of justice, in light of our moral accountability to God, our judge. How's that sound for a Hallmark Christmas card, right? Blessings to you this season as you live righteously, knowing that God will judge you righteously. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Yowser. Well, in Luke chapter 3, we see the crowds coming to John the Baptist. And he opens up with that warm, that those warm, feel, that warm feel good phrase, right? You brood of vipers, the old King James language, right? A little softened in, in the uh, common English version of the Bible. Uh, you group of snakes, you brood of vipers, in the old King James version. And he begins to tell them not to think that they're so special because of their privileged position. As children of Abraham, he strikes immediately at the ego. He strikes immediately at their sense of privilege. He strikes immediately at their sense of, I am. <laughs> I'm just perfect. <laughs> Look at me. He goes 
right for, as it were, the spiritual jugular. And he says, don't think you are anything special. Don't think you've arrived in your relationship with God. But instead, do works that show your accountability to God. Namely, produce fruits worthy of repentance. Produce fruits worthy of repentance. Do things that show your moral accountability to God. Do things that show you are changing your mind from self to God. The crowd begins, begins to ask when they hear these words. And I'm sure many of us would ask if we were to hear these words. What should we do to do these works? What do we do to prepare ourselves for the arrival of the Messiah in whom John was heralding? Well, John says this. He says, whoever has two coats must share with one who has none. And whoever has food must do likewise. And he speaks to tax collectors. The tax collectors came to him to be baptized. And they asked him, teacher, what should we do? And he said to them, collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Then soldiers also asked him, and we, what should we do? And he said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation, and be satisfied with your wages. So it would seem that according to John, we need to keep Christ in Christmas. Not by forcing other people to say Merry Christmas in a spirit of self-righteousness, but by living righteously ourselves, knowing that we will be held accountable. Feed the hungry, help the poor, love your enemies, forgive those who hurt you. Why? Because the one who is coming is also the judge of our lives. He, John says, that is Jesus, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Of course, Christ is here drawing upon the agrarian uh, the fields and the situation among the farmers of the land, saying that this one, the Messiah, is like one who is harvesting and getting ready to get all of the wheat. And what you needed to do was to have a, a winnowing fork and you would gather all the wheat and you would throw it up in the air and look what happened to the chaff. It would be, what, blown away and the wheat would fall to the ground. There was a discerning between the wheat, the stuff that produced life, and the chaff, which would blow away and would gather and it would have to be gathered and burned and brought to naught. And so we arrive at our third theme for this Advent series. What child is this? What child is this, Christ? He is the judge of our lives. He is the judge of our lives. And one of the ways we spiritually prepare for the judge's arrival is by living in ways that show our commitment and accountability to his way of love, truth, justice, and grace. At this point, some of us may be kind of like squirming a little bit. Judge, accountability, I don't do that. Well, stay with me. Just stay with me. But even though some of you may be asking yourself, maybe saying at this point, wait a minute, is God like Santa? Is he making a list and checking it twice and going to find out who's naughty or nice? And rather than deny us toys as penalty, or what I like to say to my kids, they're getting coal and stones for Christmas this year. But rather than denying us simply toys as you know penalty for our naughtiness, he rather is going to reserve a little bit of flame and fire instead. Yikes. Sounds more like Krampus than Santa Claus. Now there's a long history of bad press related to thinking about God as judge. And I, and I believe it's largely due to judgmental Christians, which are probably uh, bear, most, bear most of the blame. Someone once said, judgment belongs to the Lord, and I just want to be about the Lord's business. 
Um, well, it's that kind of attitude that has obscured, I think, the justice of God. Oftentimes, people tend to think of a judgmental God uh, who delights in dealing out pain and withholding blessing. This God of judgment frightens us. But don't get me wrong, though. There is an aspect to God that is frightening. There is an aspect to God that is awe-inspiring and beyond us. After all, he is God and we are not. And this should humble us and get us thinking whether or not we've domesticated God to suit our uh, uh, sensibilities. But thinking that God's judgment is somehow wrong or negative, I think, misses the overarching theme of biblical judgment. We in the West often recoil at God's justice for a very simple reason. And that is we've hardly had to suffer injustice ourselves. But most people around the globe recognize that God's justice is praiseworthy and great. I think the words of N.T. Wright, a former bishop of Durham in the Church of England, uh, his words are helpful here. Listen to what he says. He says this, The word judgment carries negative overtones for a good many people in our liberal and post-liberal world. We need to remind ourselves that throughout the Bible, God's coming judgment is a good thing, something to be celebrated, longed for, yearned over. It causes people to shout for joy and the trees of the field to clap their hands. In a world of systemic injustice and bullying, violence, arrogance, and oppression, the thought that there might come a day when the wicked are firmly put in their place and the poor and weak are given their due is the best news there can be. Faced with a world in rebellion, a world full of exploitation and wickedness, a good God must be a God of judgment. Did you hear those last words, sisters and brothers? A good God must be a God of judgment. Wright puts his finger on it. And it may, be, it may sound unusual or even paradoxical to, to some of us that goodness and judgment actually are to go together. But they, but they are. We cannot say God is good without saying God is just. You've all heard the saying, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for what? For good men to do, to do nothing, right? We can also say it this way, though. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is to say, I have no judgment on the matter. I have no judgment on the matter. You see, goodness and judgment belong together. According to the gospel, we live in a moral universe where right and wrong are measured in terms of a standard. And for Christians, that standard is God. In Jesus, we see what the standard of God's justice looks like. It doesn't look like an unjust maniac. It doesn't look like an insecure helicopter parent. It looks like a loving judge who values mercy over the law and who upholds the truth, not in the absence of love, but with love at its base. It's the justice of seeing the least of these cared for, it's the justice of the weak being protected, of love being extended to all, and for truth not to be forsaken. This is the kind of judgment we should all embrace. Now the question becomes, why would we, why would we resist this kind of judgment? Unless, of course, our lives are not just. This is what John the Baptist calls us to consider in today's text as we prepare ourselves and slow down during the Advent season. But we can only consider all this if we understand what child is this? What child is this? Who is this? Who is this? He is the judge of our lives, the judge of our lives, the one with the winnowing fork in his hand, the one who calls us to live righteously, knowing that our actions have consequences. Sisters and brothers, our salvation is by grace through faith in Christ, not of works, 
That sounds like a bunch of religious language, but what does that simply mean? That simply means is as we put our confidence in Christ, as we put our confidence and our trust in God, God freely, without us having to do anything other than trust, receives us, receives us, and graces us, and gifts us, not by our works, not even our good works. And that's, God doesn't love you because you're good, right? God loves you because God is good. God doesn't love us because we're good. God loves us because God is good. Doing good and living righteously are not conditions for our life with God, but they should follow from our life with God. They should follow from our life with God. This is what we're being called to this morning. This is what you are being called to, what I am being called to, to live what we say we believe. So how is your faith leading you to bless others? How is your faith leading you to give that gift to others? Not a gift that comes from, I, I, I guess I gotta do this, or I, I'm trying to be a good person, or I'm trying to get right with, no, 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 no. The gift that comes from, there is a loving judge who has shown me grace and goodness and holds me accountable, holds me accountable. And because of that, I wanna be sensitive to see where the needs are in my life so that I can show others goodness, not in order to earn favor with God, but because God has so favored me with his grace. Does that make sense? Good. So how is your faith leading you to bless others? John told the people not to allow their blessings to blind them from the necessary needs of others. I don't know about you, but I, I am seeing more and more as I get older just how entitled I think I am. So used to getting my way, right? Some of that, most, a lot of that is innocent, right? We just live in a world that caters conveniently to all of our every needs. But then there's those other things that, like, why did I get so angry that the waitress gave me that table instead of that one? My poor wife went out to dinner one night. I got so upset because I just did not like where I was. I have a wonderful meal, have a wonderful evening, and I was like a two-year-old throwing a, <clears throat> why am I sitting here? We are so spoiled, aren't we? And then you think about our spiritual blessings, all the education, all the spiritual blessings you and I have been given over the years, and how we just kind of hoard them often. We think that's good enough. And, and, and so John, of course John says to them, don't think because you're Abraham's children, don't think because you guys have all of these wonderful spiritual blessings that you're not accountable still to a judge who loves you, but a judge still. But it's easy to slip into that entitled mindset, isn't it? It's easy to do, considering all of our material and spiritual wealth. Are our blessings blinding us? If the babe in the manger is also the judge of our lives, then what we are, or excuse me, then what are the gifts we should be bringing him this season? That's the question I want to live, uh, leave with you. If the babe in the manger is also the judge of our lives, then what are the gifts we should bring him this season? Let me close with Frederick Buhner's uh, words. He says this, The New Testament proclaims that at some unforeseeable time in the future, God will ring down the final curtain on history, and there will come a day on which all our days and all the judgments upon us and all our judgments upon each other will themselves be judged. The judge will be Christ. In other words, the one who judges us most fully, or finally, will be the one who loves us most fully. Amen? Amen. Amen. God, help us as we take in uh, to consideration uh, Christ as judge and to not uh, wiggle out from that, to embrace it, but embrace it in a healthy way, a way that is true and good, a way that ultimately provokes us to be good and to do good works in your name because you've done the greatest work. You've given your life, given us our uh, redemption for that. We are thankful. We thank you for one another. We thank you for this time. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. At this time I want to invite our ushers up as we take up our offering.